truly a pleasure to be here to discuss an unfortunate topic with you, but nevertheless uh, important. Um, so I guess to start off, uh, any discussion on climate change denial or climate change policy, we kind of want to talk about the stakes, right? So what are the stakes involved with this issue? Um, effectively, we're faced with two futures. Um, on the left, we have a scenario where uh, climate change emissions peak before the middle of the century and decline rapidly. And the best case scenario that we can expect is that by the year 2100, we will have experienced only a 1.6 uh, Celsius degree average increase relative to late 19th century. Um, the, other the other trajectory is the worst case scenario and unfortunately, we're on this trajectory. Actually, we're doing worse than this trajectory. Um, but what this involves is uh, emissions don't stop. They actually increase over time. And that uh, by the end of the century, we'll have experienced an average 4.3 Celsius degree increase relative to late 19th century. So, um, so in fact, unfortunately, we are in a worst case scenario trajectory plus environment. Now, what are the impacts of this? Um, it's, we're expected to see a likely average increase in sea level between 0.5 to 1 meter rise in sea level. What's, what we need to note is that this is not a uniform increase as well. So there are certain areas of the world which will experience much more sea level rise than others. So for example, in the tropics, there'll be 20% higher sea level rise than in other places. Especially significant risk will uh, be for the small island nations and also the delta region. So Bangladesh, for example, or even Louisiana and the United States. Increased intensity of frequency of heat waves, <laughs> drying up of major rivers, um, destruction of coral reefs, uh, bio massive biodiversity loss, and of course negative impacts on agricultural production, including the United States, right? Okay, so those are the, those are the stakes that are involved. Um, now, we're currently faced with two policy futures. Um, I have some quotes here, I picked two quotes. Uh, we have on the left, we have the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton, I won't let anyone take us backwards, deny our economy the benefit of harnessing a clean energy future, or force our children to endure the catastrophe that would result from unchecked climate change. That's Hillary Clinton, November last year. Donald Trump, it was, this was a difficult one to, to pick out, which of all the tweets I should pick out. Um, January 2014, any and all weather events are used by the global warming hosters to justify higher taxes to save our planet. They don't believe it. Four dollar signs and exclamation mark. I'm not, that, that's open. We can discuss that later as the kind of interpretations of that. Um, so what's, you know, what, what are we facing here, right? So it's clear that Donald Trump, at least in his public speech, uh, denies existence, let alone the attribution of climate change to human activity. And also, it seems that there's a conspiratorial logic to his denial. So it's, it's, a, it's an extreme version of denial. Um, in his public speech, he's vowed to uh, repudiate the Paris Accord, <laughs> although that's legally complicated. We can talk about that later if you wish. Um, he's proposed to dismantle the EPA to reduce spending. He most certainly will drop Obama's clean, uh, clean power plan. Uh, he supports renewed efforts for a, kind of a, a renewed Keystone XL pipeline. He's, he's tagged Kevin Kramer, Republican from North Dakota, as his likely energy advisor. Uh, this is a vocal climate skeptic. Um, in general, it's not looking very good for climate policy in the United States with a Trump presidency. Um, although it is hard to, to determine his true intentions, and how much damage he actually can do. Um, but it's clear that he can at least, at the very least, hold up appointments to key positions and reduce agency budgets. Clinton, on the other hand, it's quite clear that she's pro-climate policy, then we can discuss kind of how much, right? But she's proposed to, she's promised to uphold the Paris Agreement. Um, she wants to uh, increase federal efforts, uh, so kind of 
clean power plan plus, right? These types of things. So um, it's clear that she would be the pro climate advocate. <clears throat> But the sad reality in the United States is that this is a house divided, really. Um, and if we just looked at, say, distribution of climate skeptics, vocal climate skeptics, in the Senate and in the House, what we see you know, in the recent 114th Congress, we see that there are 38 vocal skeptics in the Senate. That's 70 percent of all Republican senators. And there are 144 skeptics in the House. That's 58 percent of all Republican Congress people. And because it's such a polarizing, polarizing issue, um, what, the, what's, what we've had to do now in the United States is that the president would, has to circumvent Congress, right? So the, uh, the Clean Power Plan, all these things are, uh, are efforts from the president to circumvent uh, Congress. And now, actually, the Clean Power Plan is in legal trouble. Um, so the key point here is that a strong and stable climate policy requires congressional backing. Um, but we can discuss that as well later. <clears throat> so not only are politicians divided, though, the electorate, the voters, are, are, are divided on this issue. Uh, so here is public opinion data from Gallup on the question of basically attribution of climate change to human activity. Do you believe rise in human temperature in the last century is due mainly to human activities? What we see here is that there's a clear divide between Democrats up top and Republicans at the bottom. So the most recent data suggests that only 38% of Republican voters believe that humans are causing climate change, whereas 85% of Democrats believe so. There is an increase in the independents. Um, so this is a good sign. Uh, right now, 68% of independent voters believe that it's human caused. But we shouldn't be too complacent here. Uh, when it comes to, say, congressional elections, this kind of divide doesn't really, or the independents really don't matter. You think about gerrymandering, the effects of gerrymandering, and so forth. Um, this has a little bit more of an effect on, we would say, presidential or local elections, state elections. But if we were to think overall, if you just take uh, public opinion overall, only one in three Americans believe humans are uh, not, are not one, I'm sorry, one in three Americans believe humans are not the primary cause of observed climate change. And only one in 10 Americans understand that over 10, over 90% of climate scientists agree on global warming. So the major question, right? So why are Americans so divided on the issue of climate change? And social scientists have been grappling with this question. There are there are a few hypotheses that have some traction. I'll be discussing one of them, which is uh, motivating my research. The first is it could be short-term weather effects. So the weather is, you know, it's cold. It's really cold out there. What's this global warming stuff, right? So we see variation kind of in public opinion driven by weather effects. The state of the economy, when, th when times are tough, people just, climate change goes down the list. There might be some journalistic norms effects in the United States, so uh, journalists feel compelled to bring in the other side um, to offer balance. But uh, a lot of researchers, uh, and myself included, are focusing on the influence of an ideologically conservative contrarian counter movement to climate science and policy. So people like Naomi Oreskes at Harvard, Riley Dunlap, Aaron McCrite, Robert Brule, all American-based sociologists. Um, this is kind of been this is the hypothesis driving their research. Um, and so, kind of, what does this counter movement look like? It's been called the denial machine. And I guess at the end of the day, what the argument is is that this public opinion data and the division in in the House in terms of climate skepticism is not a ran. It's not. It's not generated by a random process, right? This is. There's something. Uh, real going on here behind this. And so the structure of this denial, denial machine, uh, at the top we have uh, interest groups, right? So fossil fuel industry, corporate America, so, and conservative foundations that seek to uh, benefit from obstruction of climate policy, either materially or they're driven ideologically to block climate policy. So for example, to stop government intervention in the private sector. Now, these organizations then 
support materially conservative think tanks. And these conservative think tanks are the kind of engine of information for this movement. So they, these, these think tanks leverage their status as a parallel academia. They produce policy reports. They, they're in the media. They hold conferences. They engage directly with policy makers um, and thus seek to influence policy makers. Uh, we have front groups, which are kind of public outreach groups uh, with euphemistic names. And then this is all feeding into what we call the echo chamber, which is composed of politicians, media, and um, social media as well. And the objective of this whole denial machine is to influence public opinion and to block climate policy. Now, the talk today will be focusing on conservative think tanks. That's where the majority of this research that I'll be presenting has been looking at. Um, so uh, with Travis Cohen, who's at the University of Exeter, I've studied the communication of these conservative think tanks, the major ones, in relation to how, how they communicate climate change. And there's been significant work on this uh, kind of question of what are they talking about um, by, as I mentioned earlier, uh, McCrane Dunlap in 2000. What they did is they sat down and they read over 200 documents generated by a set of conservative think tanks, took them about a summer, and they were able to classify types of arguments, right? So there's, there, it really came down to three. One is that the science is either weak or wrong. The second is that, well, if climate change was to occur, it would probably be beneficial. And the third is that any policy, any policy action that we take will, be, will, have more harm, will do more harm than good, so therefore we shouldn't do anything about it. Um, but the, since then, right, so since their, their study basically covered the majority of the documents they looked at was 1997 to 1998, since then we haven't really had an update. And the problem is that since then we have had an explosion of information. Um, so they looked at their corpus was 240 documents. Uh, since then we know now from our study that there's been over 16,000 documents generated by the largest 19 conservative think tanks on the issue of climate change. So one problem is just how do you actually read all of this stuff, right? So um, that's where we come in, Travis Cohen and I, where we leverage machine learning and natural language processing techniques to help the computer, allow the computer to help us to interpret these documents. <laughs> we'll go into that in a bit, or in, in a bit. Um, now, one motivating question has been uh, that, that, that was driving our study is this notion of the era of science denial, and it's, is it over, right? So in 2002, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Frank Luntz, is a conservative communication strategist in the United States. Uh, there was a memo that was leaked, that, uh, a memo that was circulated among Republican lawmakers that was leaked, that was authored by Frank Luntz. And in it, he says, should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. The scientific debate is closing against us, but not yet closed. There's still a window of opportunity to challenge the science. So this is 2002. And basically what Frank Luntz is saying is that we have to change our game plan. We need to attack the science head on. Don't focus on the policy, attack the root of the, root of the issue, which is the science. Now since 2002, there's been speculation as to, well, what's going on here? How are these skeptic groups communicating denial, right? Uh, Leo Hickman in The Guardian in 2013 made the claim, the real world is leaving behind those who flatly reject the signs underpinning the notion that anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are warming the planet. So in other words, this science skepticism is dead, right? These people are dinosaurs. And we've moved on now. And, you know, similar, uh, similar claim from the Union of, Union of Concerned Scientists in 2015. It's kind of a lighter version, but it says, deniers now can see that climate change is real, but reject the scientific consensus that human activity, mainly burning fossil fuels, is driven by it, or is driving it, rather. Right? So the, the one issue is that we, we don't know, right? We don't actually know what, how the evolution of the discourses has occurred, right? Um, because it's been so difficult to study, right, the, the immense amount of documents. And so this was kind of an auxiliary test of our study to see, well, how are they treating science? Are they discussing science more than policy, or is it inversed over time? 
Okay, but the first question is kind of what are they talking about? Uh, not to go into detail, but I'll be very happy to go into detail in the, in the question and answer period, but what we've done is we've ha had the, the computer has, allowed, has helped us to cluster all these words. So in our corpus, we have over 24 million unique words, right, in this collection of documents, 16,000 documents. We've been able to cluster these words into themes, right? So we can think of them as topics. And that these topics then are, we can measure how similar or dissimilar they are to one another. And so what we see is we have these kind of clusters of themes within this huge corpus of documents. And what we find is that there are certain clusters here that themes have all to do with science, scientific integrity, domestic and international politics, sorry, that's kind of corrupted there, policy and regulation, and energy emissions. This right here is green jobs. The size of these numbers, so each of these numbers is an identifier for one of the 47 <coughs> topics that we found in the corpus. And the size of this, uh, the, the identifier, signifies how important that is, or in, in effect, in, how, how, how often this thing occurs in the sample, in the corpus. How important it is, in other words. So there's some takeaways here. We see that the discussion of scientific integrity, so this is attacks on scientists and scientific bodies themselves at, as, you know, ad hominem attacks. So that there's a conspiracy or that, there's a, that the climate change is a hoax or that there really is no consensus among scientists on climate change. The words that they use when they discuss those types of arguments is actually quite different than the scientific discussion that they have, right? So they use words that are very similar, say, to what the words that they use in politics. Right, and um, so it's not just when they're attacking the scientific bodies, they're not using the same words that they use when they're attacking the science itself. Um, and this is important because in the experimental literature, uh, psychologists have found that subjects who are exposed to information on consensus are more likely to support climate policy. So in a way here, the, they, are, they know there's a strategy to have a specific type of attack on the scientists themselves attacking the, the consensus, for example. Okay. Now we can take each of those topics and we can isolate them and we can see how these topics trend over time in terms of intensity of discussion, right? So I've selected two of them here to kind of highlight. Uh, the way that we would interpret this is these are uh, the probabilities of this topic arising collapse at the quarter level, so first, second, third, fourth quarter of a year. If I was to take any point here, I would say, OK, well, this top graph is signifying the, the evolution of the discussion on cap and trade. And we see that it spikes at certain periods, Lieberman, when the Lieberman-Warner bill was uh, in effect or was put forward, and the Waxman-Markey bills, right? And the way, the way I would describe this is I would say, at this point in this, in this quarter, in 2000, uh, late two, or 2008, right? Um, if I was to take an average document, pull out a document from this corpus of 16,000 documents, about 10% of that document would have to do with cap and trade, right? So that's the way we would, we would interpret this graph. The same can be said for the scientific misconduct. There's, there's a topic that we labeled scientific misconduct. And this peaks when the Michael Mann, the hockey stick uh, controversy arose. There were congressional hearings on that. Then when the so-called climate gate scandal occurred, um, when there was leaked emails from the University of East Anglia, um, there was a spike about kind of this is a conspiracy, so on and so forth, right? So we can do this for each of the topics. Well, getting back to the original question, well, are they talking about science or are they talking about policy now, right? And how has that evolved over time? Um, what we see is actually, uh, looking at this top graph, and I apologize, it came out corrupted, but um, the gray line, the gray confidence intervals are the discussion of science, and the blue is policy, right? So I took, we took all of these topics and we collapsed them into, is this about science or is this about politics or policy? And what we find is that um, discussion of science seems to be dominant in the pre-2007 period, right, or 2008 period. 
Then there's an overtaking by policy, but then again, going into the 2013 period, again, there's a renewed emphasis on, on science. Now, this, there's some nuance here with our research, which is that we have these 19 conservative think tanks, right? Well, we're assuming that all of them are equally important, right? Well, there's some of them that are only devoted to science, and we know that. So there's, a, there's an organization called, uh, C, uh, the acronym is CO2 Science, or the short version is CO2 Science. Their major emphasis is that carbon dioxide is actually a good thing and they review academic literature trying to support this argument. Um, and so if we remove them from the sample and then we rerun this, we see that, well, policy seems to be dominant, but science and policy <coughs> seem to converge at certain crucial times. So for example, when uh, An Inconvenient Truth came out, or when the IPCC uh, uh, was awarded, and Al Gore were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and later in 2013, there's also convergence. Well, again, is this a fair representation of the conservative think tanks? Or are there certain think tanks that we should actually be focusing on uh, more specifically, right? So again, influence and power within this space is not uniform. But we can focus on one uh, actor, the Heartland Institute. The Heartland Institute has been called by The Economist the world's most prominent skeptical think tank, and they display that proudly on their website. Um, and uh, they, every year they hold a, uh, a kind of a climate denialist pseudoscientific conference. Uh, they had billboards at one point that were equating uh, climate scientists to Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Um, kind of a domestic terrorist in the United States. Um, and what we find is that if we only look at the Heartland Institute starting in 2002, going back to that discussion on, from Frank Luntz, right, steering the Republicans one way, we need to focus on the science. This organization took that task, and they've been increasing their discussion of science ever since, and discussion of policy in relative terms has been going down. What we're working on right now is we're trying to study in the same manner other other components of this framework, right? Um, so right now at the moment, we're with John Cook from the University of Queensland, we're working on the blog, the blogosphere, so social media, and kind of sneak peek as to our research, or to our results thus far. A similar type of analysis shows that if we only look at blogs, and by blogs I mean we've gathered uh, Little, little over a quarter million blog posts from 59 climate change skeptic blogs um, from 2004 to 2016. We see that, in, at least in social media, in the blogosphere, the deniers uh, emphasize science uh, much more than policy. Uh, and then we can discuss future research um, in terms of politicians and so forth in the Q&A. But in conclusion, if we were looking just at this uh, conservative think tanks, their discussion has grown rapidly since 1998, since that last kind of dis uh, study that I mentioned earlier on. And it peaked in 2009. It's declined a little, a little since then, but it's been ramping up again. Uh, the discourse touches on a wide range of topics, and I discussed the themes, that the, that these higher order themes that we can see, the clustering of topics which are politics, policy, science, but also scientific integrity is a distinct theme. Um, and it's closer semantically to politics than science. And from the discussion after, we can see that the discussion of science among these organizations hasn't, hasn't gone down over time. If anything, it's gone up. Um, and therefore, we can infer that the era of climate science denial is not over. Why is this important? Because if there is not at least an agreement as to the underlying cause of the problem by all major actors, there can be no comprehensive solution to the problem, right? This is the takeaway, right? Um, and unfortunately, we don't see that convergence in the United States among these actors at the moment. Uh, and these conservative think tanks tend to react to the external environment. I suggested I showed how the external events happen and then they start talking about it more. This cre lends credibility to our to our measures, um, but 
what it also shows is that we need to have these long time series data generation efforts as we're doing right now at the moment to test kind of key questions.